Proto Traveler, as I am reliably informed, because we're using the facsimile edition of the 1977 OG What Have We Done Game Designers Workshop, the GD Dubs version of Traveler. And tonight, look at this, we got 15 guys in the house. This is phenomenal. It's almost as though consistent application provides consistent results. The Jim Bros know what I'm talking about. Speaking of, you know what I'm talking about. The little thumbnail for today's video. The, 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 for those of you that don't know, I was looking for a space dinosaur and it occurred to me that we have a Hugo nominated novella, Space Raptor Butt Invasion. It was nominated for the Hugo Award in, I believe it was 2016. It lost out. I can't remember who it lost to. I think that was the year it lost to no one. I think that's the year no one applied. That was the year that George R.R. R. Martin gave wooden buttholes to all of his friends at the, <laughs> at the Hugo Awards, and I thought, that's hysterical. I'm going to slap Muldoon on, because he's hunting this space raptor. And it is a, uh, it's like a whole man-on-man uh, -on -man hot, uh, uh, what do they call that? Romance novel. It still cracks me up. Space Raptor Butt Invasion, Hugo nominated by the creative genius Chuck Tingle. He was nominated the next year for a book called Oh, I can't remember now. Some, some something about in something about a T-Rex and in the bunt. I but I don't I mean I'm actually not a huge fan of the Chuck Tingle oeuvre. I'm just a huge fan of people messing with the Hugo Awards. And boy howdy, did we all take second place? To the, the CCP. You know what I'm talking about. Hey, today we're talking about Traveler, and enough of that silliness. We got a couple of things to talk about here. The first thing I want to mention is, you know, my go-to, my boy, my, got my back, my, my right-hand man here, Brian Renninger, pointed out we were doing things a little bit wrong last time when it came to the animals. And that is this table here. I was reliably informed by some of the viewers that when you create an animal here in book three, I should have written the page down, but eh, what are you going to do? Let me bring this front and center, and then we'll, we'll check in on the chat, see who all's chatting. We've got two columns here, and I thought, oh, this is how many hits they can take and how many hits they can dish out, and then you have to modify the dish out. This is the wounds modification. Whoa, time, whoa, time out. That's not the case. If we flip back here to page 25 and read chapter and verse, just so that everybody knows what we're talking about. Uh, when an animal has received wounds equaling or exceeding the first dice throw, the animal is unconscious. In other words, our we only rolled, we were seriously undercutting our, our um, what do we call them? Uh, wump snipes. They were a uh, five, a 25 kilogram animal. And oh, we got to talk about that too. We need. We might need to retcon some of the safari. They should have no twelve kilograms. I think with with oh with we rerolled for weaponry. Look, I could probably check my notes. Long story short, they should have two d hits before they're unconscious, and then two dice worth of hits before they're dead. In other words, the black dice will go first. We should have had six hits to make them unconscious, and then another nine after that before they are finally dead. The wounds is what, right? So, so we these were tiny baby little snipe wumps. Sorry, guys. Maybe, maybe they were size three, but I'm not going to like retcon. We're just going to live with it. But we've learned now. Next time we have an animal encounter, when the space raptors come after us, we're going to be giving them the full two, two to 12 and two to 12. The wounds chart is related to how much blamage they do to your characters. I'm going to flip back a couple of pages and see what kind of weapons are available to these guys. Uh, when you create your animal... Uh, no, we don't. So here's... T and this is why I was a little confused. Wait a minute. If hits... If this is what they can dish out, why do we have to worry about teeth, horns, hooves, and weapons, right? When we look at our weapon chart... For those particular items, that will tell us how much damage they do, sort of. Uh, here, here we go. We have horns do 2d minus 5 hit points. We'll bring it a little closer, maybe we can see a little bit better there. 
uh, teeth. If you get bit, you do 2D minus 3, except if you have a tiny little animal, uh, 12 or 25, it's minus a die. So if you get bit by an animal that's small, the teeth are only going to do 1D minus 3 damage. I'm assuming this comes off the number of dice you roll. You wouldn't roll two dice minus three and then subtract another die. That would be complicated and, and not in keeping with the spirit of the game. Instead, the small animals, and we get up to these big boys, when you get up to the 400 kilogram monsters, this is the 800 pound space gorilla, you add two dice. So getting bit by a two, by a two the 800 pound space gorilla means you're gonna be taking 4D minus three. Those things are dangerous. So important point, lesson learned, this is how we learn to play these complicated games. It's only 100 pages, but there's all kinds of information buried in these paragraphs that you have to, you got, you got to, you got to have a support crew. Even as solo war gamers, we need to be able to talk about this stuff. Jump on over on the artist formerly known as Twitter. Start, start blabbing about your campaigns. Tell us what you did so guys can jump in and go, um, excuse me. And they push their glasses up with the finger. Um, actually, um, that's the number of two dice versus one dice. And as long as they're not being total chodes about it, you know, you, you'll appreciate it. You'll have a good time. You'll get better at the game. And the next time you play it, you get it right. You knock it out of the park. If an animal receives wounds equal to twice its hits, it is destroyed and has lost any food or pelt value. Of course, we lost a value if we killed one. But I think, I think we're still okay because I think the fact that we were blasting away with a scattergun, kachoon, kachoon, we probably did enough damage to knock a couple of them out. A little bit of first aid on these wump snipes, and, and we're back in business. We're still good. I came up with a system. Now, here's the other question I wanted to talk about. The standard campaign for Traveler, Proto Traveler, updated you know, in, in a few areas with the, the um, classic Traveler rules, j just where it makes sense uses, like, they're really vaguely defining things. It doesn't use the Third Imperium. That hasn't been written yet. They haven't decided that first you get the monies, you know? They they haven't expanded with the splat creep, right? So they talk about scouts, but they didn't really explain what that is. Who are they working for? And we need somebody that our scout can work for. And so I thought, well, you know, if he's an explorer, who is the classic explorer society, right? We're all familiar with I mean, these days it's a bit of a meme. I've used it in, in, in my pimping of the solo campaign. Men wanted, hazardous duty, low pay, survival, not guaranteed, glory if successful, right? That's the ad that they had in like the royal, what did they call it? Like the royal um, philosophical society, exploration society. Uh, we have the National Geographic Society these days. So, but we're not like, we're not dealing with geography here. We're dealing with a galaxy. So I'm going to call his sponsor. The guys that actually own the ship are the National Galactographic Society. And they say, we want you to go out and explore, take pretty glossy pictures. If you can get pictures of natives with their tops off, preferably female, that will drive readership. And then we can write, we can use people's natural innate curiosity to propagandize them about whatever our political cause du jour is. And that's what our scout is going to be doing. With his buddies, we saw in the thumbnail, good old Muldoon Apples and Jeremy Powell. Wait, was it, was it Muldoon Apples? No, it's Jeremy Powell is our scout. One other thing I'll point out before we move on. I, I thought he was going to have a club because, right, we're doing the whole bonk, except... The problem with that decision is, I mean, I, I, I know this is RPGs, making suboptimal top tactical decisions because they give us more character it has limits. Our, our boy here, Jeremy, right? He's fast because he had to run fast if he wanted to eat dinner. He had seven brothers after all. He's only got a strength of three. If you're trying to use a club with a strength of three, you're at minus four to hit. But bruh, that's not going to work for us. So I gave him a blade. I looked at these and I thought, well, a dagger has a lower... Look, we're at strength three. It doesn't matter what weapon we take, we're going to be at a minus. Now, a foil is a little too highfalutin, I think, a little too hoity-toity. So I just went with a blade, basic standard blade. I noticed that um, in these tables, we, we also have... You know, it's funnily enough, the melee weapons, 
have bonuses and penalties for whether you're at close range or short range. Mark Miller thought of everything. This game is a gem. 1977? This is... Uh, for all of its warts, holy cow, does he pack a lot of great consideration and, and elegance into this rule set. The the when we attack with the uh, with the blade, we're at minus. What did I say? Because he's such a he's such a wimp. We're at minus two. But you know, anytime you're attacking with a blade, you're at plus one, plus one for close and short range. So we're only at minus one. We're still hitting on a nine, which ain't great, but it's a darn sight better than hitting on thirteens or box cars, right? So I gave him the blade. A little bit of a change from what we talked about last time. Let me check in in the chat. See if you guys are still around. We had a. 15 people. Phenomenal. Oh, I got to put my old man cheater readers on for this one. Ba -ba -ba -bam. Who all's in the house? We've got Syric, Thorsten. Oh, you guys are checking in before I even started. How Lost in Space would happen. Somebody pointed out the crew of the Black Raven. This is a great excuse to download a copy of the Snarling Badgers game, uh, Space Station Zero. Um... That's the one by, by Uncle Get Along Gang Adam, the man who never had an opinion that he was willing to stand by. I, I like his channel. I watch it a little bit. But holy cow, is that guy like fall over himself to just validate everything you believe? Here at this channel, we believe in good stuff, and there are some bad stuff. Uh, Penfold, you got chat banned for 24 hours? That is tragic. Is it probably because, is it because we were talking about, like... The, the 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 other K word, the one of the seven little words that you're not supposed to use on YouTube about um, unaliving people. Uh, Christopher Seaball traveled around the desert to get here tonight. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, Brian Renninger, of course, we already gave him the shout out. Thank you for the help. Penfold is lactating. <laughs> okay, well, we're, it's the Milky Way, so you're you're riding the Milky Way. Todd Carlson, I'm so tired of award shows. Just industry folks patting themselves on the back. Yeah, and I, man, I tell you, man, look up a picture of what the Hugo guys look like. Wow, man. Wow. Talk about, uh, talk about, uh, he, well, I'm, I don't want to get too insulting. You know, they, they, their lives are hard enough as it is. Commented on the video the next day about the animal wounds. I should have posted this into the chat last night, too. Yeah, Syrick, he's, you know, he's one of my elite guys. One, one of my coaches. Uh, Penfold Gab is closing down tomorrow. No, it's not. They, I just heard that they're, you're going to have to pay to post the, uh, videos or pictures, but it, it'll still be around. It'll be free. Some old sickos chasing down coyotes today on their golf cart. Basic expert. Good to see you, brother. I, his, if for those of you that don't know, if you want to go through a full live read through, well, not live, I mean, it's, it's recorded, but if you want a full read through of this, he was one of my inspirations. The... You know, you know the the eagles have the wind beneath their wings. I, I'm kind of an edge lord, so I have like stink lines reading off of mine. But if I had wind beneath my wings, a basic expert would be one of those guys. You know, puffing me up. DJ is. I'm running a stream that's not at his midnight. Yeah, we're rolling early today. How about that? Uh, has anyone retro cloned to this in Bradford Walker format? I don't know what that means, but you can check JohnMollison.com. I've got uh, some after action reports, and then I actually wrote down how we did the safari so if you decide to run one of these for your crew it gives you just that basic chess checklist and a few things you need to consider if you're going to run your own uh basic expert the game this game is a game that looks at chain mail man to man and runs in a different way with it i think mark played oe with chain mail 2d6 and uh wait wait no 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 i just accidentally pushed something i need to fix that uh he played original Edition D&D with Chainmail and 2D6, and that's where this game is born from. 2D6 is great, man. Who doesn't love a good bell curve? We love the bell curve more and more all the time. I've met a lot of the usual Hugo crowd, and uh, who says Bradford, he knew a few. Yeah, I don't miss them. They're, I, you know, it's, you know why they're so petty, right? It's because the stakes are so small. Uh, and, and it's, and frankly, I think a lot of us, like, in this part of the hobby... Like, I, I don't, every, there's a lot of things people just say because everybody says it. I don't know that, 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 that most of that stuff is true. People just say, oh, Dungeons and Dragons was for nerds. Well, I don't, you know, and then I played it in the 1980s. And I, look, 
I, I was an absolute dork. I was a hot mess in high school. I had, I didn't just have issues, as they say. I had whole subscriptions. But I played D&D with regular guys. They were just, you know, not necessarily jocks, but particularly, I do remember walking around Gen Con 1991 and being struck by how normal most people were. I, granted, you know, that we were grading on a curve, but there were guys walking around there that would not have looked out of place on a WWE ring. There were just tons of, you know, a lot of like metalheads, lots of, you had to be smarter than the average bear. We didn't have a lot of guys walking around glassy eyed, not a lot of stoners at, at that Gen Con, but I was really impressed. And, and over the years, most of the people that I wind up gaming with, they're just regular guys, you know, I, and, and I don't know that, that, I think the thing is that the people that talk most about this game, the guys that like get heavily into it are on the autism spectrum to a certain extent and and they have different priorities than the social order so the the like the guys that get the press are the like top 10 percent and yeah the top 10 percent of enthusiasts are dorky but i don't know that that's true in DD any more than any other hobby i did marathons back in the day when i had a younger man's knees and let me tell you you go into a marathon shop and let me tell you about my last race. And you know you're in for a five-minute like spiel and story that's pointless and goes nowhere. That's the triathlete version of let me tell you about my character. Let me tell you about my $2,000 bike that I bought. No, I'm good. I Really, I got, I got things to do, guy. I don't have time for this. It's true in any hobby that you get into. There's people that get too into it and they just like give everybody a bad rap. I think D&D is the same way. Even the theater kids, I think, um, I think they on the whole, are mostly normal. But when you look around, particularly something like YouTube, these are the people that are trying, you know, I, yeah, I know, I know. These are the people that are trying to like make a name for themselves. So they go over the top and it looks weird. But I, I think most of you guys in the chat are generally normal people. Like I, I'd have most of you over for, you know, I don't know. We could hit the gym together. We, we could have your non-alcoholic beverage of choice. I, you get it, right? DJ says the theater kids are supposed to be playing vampire. Yeah, you know, I, the LARPing is a far better activity for the theater kids, but it hasn't quite made the social jump that tabletop role-playing has, um, probably in large part due to the atomization of our society. But but I, at the time, a vampire... the. The Gathering came out in 91, and I remember looking at the tables and going, oh, that's like a, that's kind of like what I'm doing, but different. And I'm really glad those guys are over there so I can get back to my, you know, war games over here. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I didn't have issues. <laughs> well, it's, it's not original to me. Uh, Intanius, uh, DJ, their pawns, are there pawns in Monopoly? Well, there's a car and a top hat. Uh, my 10-year-old is my pawn. I make her my pawn. Uh, YouTube really does bring out the weirdos in a lot of cases. But again, like most of the guys that I've talked to, you look at um, guys like the basic expert. You look at guys like Rolling Bones. You look at guys like uh, uh, Dunder Moose, right? E even if you can get past the accent, which, again, you know, he speaks English better than I speak, whatever jibber-jabber is his native tongue. Guys like uh, Stay Puffed. Right? They're stay buffed. Jeez, oh, not drawing a blank. Stay buffed, Marshmallow Man. Victor Gorbachev. You're just regular guys, man. There's a lot of us out there. Don't lose heart. Keep looking for them. You'll find them, right? Uh, Paul Stanley's abnormal and proud of it. Yeah. I, it, but again, a, a lot of us also hide our true power. People, uh, I, when I'm on the road, I ask people, hey, what should I go do in this town? I want to go see stuff. You know what I'm saying? And they say, well, like, what kind of things do you want to do? And I think, oh, I, I should have planned ahead, shouldn't I? I should have thought about that second question. Um, do I want to tell them where do I play Dungeons and Dragons? Like, I, it, it, literally, a couple of days ago, I'm in a parking lot. Hey, what do I need to do in this town? Are you from here? Where do I go? What do I do? And they're like, what are you into? And I'm like, well, I mean, I'm not into, I'm not going to hang out at a bar, right? I'm not picking up floozies. I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not even into like fancy restaurants, but I'm not going to tell this guy, um, where can I go to pretend to be a Jedi on Tuesday night? These days might not be such a big deal, but I'm like, I don't know, I, hiking maybe like museums. 
So we do tend to hide our our power. And it's like, what are you into? Even like at the office, people are like, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, you know, I play games. And they're like, yeah, games. But they don't they don't need to know that three to four nights a week, I'm talking to 21 of my best friends about my space travel game, which we should probably get to. I'm I'm doing a little bit of vamping because we're in the downtime. Let's take a look at that calendar real quick. We gotta we gotta go back and look at the calendar again. I think because we can find some adventure. We've got three little black books that are chock full of adventure. If we can't find a little bit of adventure today, and we may need to set up something so we can take a couple of minutes to prepare and, and like we did the safari. But here's here's the thing. Let me zoom in, right? I stopped hiding my hobby 15 years ago. Yeah, well, it's it's like everything else, David Lee, right? There's a time and place for everything. And I don't really, like, because we're playing these games at such a high level, the things that are interesting to talk about are not the sorts of things that normies are going to be into. Uh, again, I, I took up weightlifting. And, I, and I'm granted, I'm a neophyte. But, you know, when, am I really going to talk about, like, how many reps and sets I did and who I'm reading and which videos I'm watching? To, you know, am I on my, my hypertrophy phase or am I on my, am I doing a cut? That's not the kind of thing you talk to normies about, right? You're just like, yeah, I work out a couple of times a week. Yeah, at the, at the you know, at, at this gym, right? You keep it light. It, and it's not even necessarily that you're hiding it. It's just that there's a time and place for everything. And, and I, keep it simple, you know? Yeah, I just tell me where the best hiking trail is. Everybody likes hiking. Everybody likes walking. We all do it. All right. You guys keep talking about that in the chat. I'm going to move on with the campaign. The snipe hunt began on the 27th. That is yesterday. Oh, I forgot to point out today is February 28th. Uh, we're hunting. We're hunting. Kablam. Wait, we, the day two. Kablam, kablam. We catch our boys. And then we're just a day out. So we get back at the end of the day on March 1st. Friday is payday. We don't have any hirelings. We don't have anything to, to deal with. Then we said, well, we're gonna, we have to spend four days resting, just taking it easy, chilling out. Now, the National Galactographic Society has a Type S scout ship for berths. We got three guys. We can take a passenger if we need to. We might need to take along somebody that can help us with some of those functions of the, the scout ship. But we'll worry about that later because we're not ready to jump planet yet. We may have... The safari was fun. I'd be willing to do a second safari and see if we can collect some more animals. Uh, that, that's the other thing I'll point out. By having the National Galactographic Society as our patron, so to speak, we now have an excuse to go gallivanting about the subsector, right? Uh, we don't need to, like, come up with a reason to be scouting. Now, granted, we've got a blank subsector, so we have a reason. I, I want to see what's over the next hill, and when I climb that hill, I, oh, there's another hill behind it, right? There's always another hill to climb. But we now have this idea that we need to, like, take some really good photos. We're going to collect some specimens. And at some point, we may decide, oh, shoot, we should go back to, we should find the nearest scout base, which for us is the branch office of the National Geogalactic, uh, National Galactographic Societies. I should have picked an easier name. The NGS. Uh, field office to drop off our specimens. So that's going to be a regular repeating thing for us. Of course, we have to go there to refuel anyway, but, you know, now we have additional reasons to do that. We have to get through the four days. Remember, every time you have a day of, of, of downtime, there is a one-third chance that you have an encounter with some locals. Some of the local yokels might start harassing us. So we got to make those checks. We're going to do that today. We're going to have to do it for the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. The scout will not be available until we pass that check. Uh, the other thing I want to address before we make those die rolls, though, is the Black Raven. I have caved in to peer pressure. The Black Raven is located right here in hex 0201 of the Penfold subsector, and they're drifting in space. Everybody wants to see more of the Magic Space Baby, and I totally get that. Penfold asks, is this the same guy that was from the Fishbowl Ice Planet? You know, it occurred to me that we did a little bit of an Ice Pirates thing, because Blaine's World doesn't have a gas giant, 
So the way you get fuel up to the unrefined fuel is to mine the ice from the polar caps. Remember our ice bumpkins? Yeah. Well, but rice pirates thing going there. I think that's kind of fun. We, we could work with that. As far as the Black Raven is concerned, I'll give them a shot, guys. You guys want it? I'll give them a shot. I am going to give them once a week. We'll make it. We'll just call it Sunday. See how I wrote down? BR uh, Rando. BR Rando. I don't. What does that say? Oh, th so the, the Black Raven jumped on the 6th. They're going to start blasting for a week and a half. So starting on the 10th, there's a chance, right? Oh, there's a one in a million chance that they're rescued. So you're saying there's a chance. I'm going to roll the dice, and on boxcars, we have an encounter. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have been rescued. That does necessarily mean that we have to roll on the encounter chart. It could be pirates find them, shove them out the airlocks, and steal their little bit of cargo. We'll have to figure that out when we roll on the random encounter table, okay? So it's slim chance, but we'll give it to them. Is that it? Yeah, and it's going to be on boxcars, man. So, you know, that's, that's me meeting you halfway. I am a kind and benevolent referee who, you know, takes your input. And this is, uh, we're, we're doing a group activity here. We're playing alone together, as I always say. They're coming back. They're, they're going to be back one way or the other. Even if I have to um, come up with an entirely different rule set to play with these guys, they are 100% coming back. So let's do that. I got to roll for the random encounter checks. And because we are in the city of Marriott, we named it after our buddy Vic. It's one T, though. You know, we, we don't want him to get too big a head. We get, uh, you know, too full of himself for having a city named after. Probably founded, probably named after the founder of the city. There's like a statue of him standing there, you know, chest puffed out, maybe pointing down into the valley where he found suitable plants that could be harvested. There's not going to be a plantation. You know, that, that's just a bad idea. Uh, do, 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 because it is, you know, there's acid rain down there. But you go out and you cut some leaves and, you know, that's all it. it, it it's fine. Combat. Oh, no, we're, we should be looking in in the adventure. Ah, you know, the other thing we can do. Ah, ah, oh, oh, oh. Well, I just have to roll, first of all. On the second, on a five or a six, that's a deuce. Nothing there. Five or a six, that's a four. Nothing on the third. What about the fourth? We have an encounter on the 4th. Who is that encounter with? Uh, and we have to figure out what the reaction is. Here we go. I'm using my cheat sheet, my referee's card. There you go. On the far left, we have to find out who we encounter. We got two dice rolls. And because... Oh, this is, this is fun. Um, we have these sixes down here. And I'm going to add to our world's character. Let me, let me go back to my Blaine's world. Blaine's world. Janov 36 is not it. So Blaine's world, here we go. Uh, I'm going to make another little table down here for random encounters. In Traveler 1977... When you roll a six on the tens place for your random encounter check, look, look at those blanks. They're treated as nothing until you fill those out yourself. Well, we've got 61, 2, 3, 64, 65, and 66. Oh, we made it. All right. There ain't nothing, right? We now have a planet with some, uh, with some character to it. So we can actually look at this. What do we got here? Peasants, workers... Rowdies, thugs, tourists, fugitives. Now, we could just, you know, we'll have to come up with explanations for all of these. But we might have something unique here in the random encounters. Like, who in, in our acid planet are we likely to run into here? That we haven't ordinarily seen. And I think maybe we might run into a band of hunters. Right now, now we went out and we poached, and they may be mad at us because we caught 
a something that, that they had been chasing for years. And we went out and we found one on our first day and caught one on our second day. So they may be jealous of us. Uh, is there, are there any other chat? It's up to you, man. Magic Space Daddy says Todd, Todd Carlson. I like it when you call me that. Uh, Penfold missed like two episodes. Uh, no, okay, so just, just so you're, let, let me catch up to speed. This is a scout. I took a poll on uh, the artist formerly known as Twitter, and I said, do you guys want to see a jungle hunt, or do you want to see a scout? And those two tied. There was a third. Do we do like a pit fight? Do we go straight EC tub on this one? And it was close, man. It was like 30 to 33 to 33. But those two tied, so I have a scout who did a jungle hunt, and now he's got his ship. Our scout is modeled after the scout from Team Fortress 2. His name is Jeremy Powell, right? Right? Uh, Arthur Baden Powell, founder of the Boy Scouts. So we're, we're, we're dipping heavily into that scout thing. Um, I, we're going to have washers, too. We, we, this city employs uh, street washers to help rinse off the acid rain and make sure that the uh that 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 the stuff doesn't corrode so 63 through 66 we'll leave those blank for now and i think uh maybe we have uh the hunters are going to be 1d6 and the washers are going to be again we'll just do 1d6 because i can't think of anything better um i don't know what vehicle is uh for weaponry Oh, now, oh, this is a great point. Oh, I forgot about that. What's legal here? Everything is illegal. So the only thing, oh boy, okay. The only thing, once you get to the port, once you get to the, like, the entryway, you have to check your weapons there. Like, the only place you can have those weapons is the starport. And I'm guessing the starport is, like, let's think about this. Because the starport is, like, the um, Casablanca of every planet that you're on. The, the international law, intergalactic law applies there, and you can't have weapons. But once you leave that, then you have to check your weapons. So I'm assuming that all of the weapons, all of the shooty weapons, are um, on the ship at this point. They're back at the, the cabin. The, these hunters are going to have the only thing they can have on the streets. And these are going to be you know law-abiding uh, you know, upright, they, they've got their hunting licenses and all of that. If, if they're outlawing guns, then they're probably going to be registering hunters. Uh, so with a nine, possession of any weapon outside, long-bladed weapons are controlled. Man, we're at nine, so it's going to be fisticuffs if we run into anybody. Um, unless they're illegal types, in which case they may have bludgeons or clubs. Or maybe even blades, but we don't have blades because we, we don't want to get we don't want to get in trouble with the law. I think that's it. So we we rolled a, a six. So who do we encounter? Black die is the tens place. A thirty two means a noble with retinue. All right, let me write this down. Career, uh, T, T a dime. We're on Blaine's world, so we got to make a Tia Carrera reference. Carrera, T a dime, because she's a dime, baby. She and her retinue show up, and her retinue consists of, well, there's two, two D6 of them. So, and she's got seven of her hand... Uh, well, I guess they would be more like hand administrative assistants because our government here is a, uh, oh, it's balkanized. Um, and what did we say about the, the cliff dwellers are ruled by an oligarchy. So she's part of the royal family, if you will. And she's probably got, let's call it five of her administrative assistants and two guards, G U A R. I'm I'm a good at I'm a, I'm a spellologist. I know how things are spelled. Two guards. And the guards are going to have um billy clubs and that's about it cuz everything's illegal. Well, of course if she is a noble, then they might have revolvers too. Remember, gun control is for peasants, not important people. That's how equality works. 
Uh, Noble with retinues. Oh, it says here they've got foils. Okay, so scratch that. We're, we're playing by written. They've got foils, and then uh, do they have... Oh, they might have a special weapon here. And for this, let's see, boo, 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 do we have a, we got to roll a D6, and we get a 3, which means, I'm so confused by this now. i got to go back to the rules. Here's the chart that I'm looking at here, additional weapons. And if you'll forgive me for just a moment. That's all it takes. And I think I'm getting better at my book control now. When you have your adventurers and your random tables, here we go. The V in the V column means they have a vehicle. Well, we do oh, I have to I have to check. Nobility. Persons with a standing of eleven or greater are likely to be nobility. Uh, at the discretion of the referee, they have a uh, ranking of well, she's gonna have a ranking of it doesn't say here. It just says noble with retinue. She has 11 or higher, uh, may have ancestral lands. The nobility table indicates the actual designations or titles from 11 to 15. So I think maybe we're going to roll 2d6 and we will add, uh, it's going to be a minimum of B, uh, her, wh whether she's a dame or a baroness or a marchioness. How do we want to do this though? We'll roll 2d6 and we'll add seven with a minimum so she's most likely to be a dame but <laughs> all right she is the c man i love dice she is the uh chief noble officer what what would the oligarchy what what it's not a business thing now right so if she's an oligarchy she is the uh, Grand Queen, Queen, I, I should have just made it, uh, my friend Macho Mandolf whipped up a character and came up with a, somehow he got a nobility of like 16, which means he's got to be a king, and that's basically what we're doing here. So the Grand Queen, now this being the case, I'm going to flip these around, she's going to have two of her administrative assistants, and she's going to have five guards but they're not just going to have revolvers. This is the real Mama Jamma. She's in a vehicle. And let's see what she thinks of our three scruffy looking... Now, they will have... They're going to have pikes. And... Oh, I, I was I was looking for the special weapons here, wasn't I? Uh, consult the weapons table. Throw one die for column one. If a weapon is shown, one person is armed with it. So one of these guys, the chief... Might be armed with something a little special for anyone who thinks they're going to do any harm. I hope they don't mistake us for the ice bumpkins, because they might uh, rough us up on their way by. And, okay, here we go. So I rolled on the one, and one of them is going to have a laser rifle. So her, her chief guard will have a laser rifle, and the other guards will have, uh, it says here, halberds and daggers for guards. So we're kind of mixing it up a little bit here. I think we're I think we're that's 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 legitimate, man. Uh religious group noble with retinue. Two dice, two dice. Uh they have halberds and daggers. And then I think we're gonna have to give them so Pikes is halberds. And then we are gonna give them pistols. We'll give them straight up pistols for defense. Uh so the five guards. Now the question becomes Do we catch the eye of Queen Carrera? Maybe we pronounce that Tiadame to disguise the fact that we're calling that might, you know, I don't, my wife might not appreciate me talking about um, smoking hot Tia Carrera. You know, the library, wasn't she in, uh, what was the adventure show she did? The like low budget, um, uh, what do you call it? Syndicated show. It was something, it wasn't the librarian. She was in like a, a, a knockoff Indiana Jones. Can't remember. You guys probably know. Uh, dice throws are two and twelve. When they are encountered, their reaction will dictate what happens. Uh, so now we turn our attention to this reaction table, and this is going to be we already we already rolled our our box cars right. So probably not going to be genuinely friendly. 
Uh, if we have five plus military terms, if the population is 11 or higher, it's not. Population is low enough. It's just a straight 2D roll. If it's violent, then they're mad at us. And I don't know why. We'll figure that out. I get a nine. And she says, hey, baby, I'm intrigued. What's with the scrawny guy? Did I hear about him? Did I hear? Is he on the, the front page of the paper as the first guy to discover and bring back live examples of the snipe wump? I don't know. So she's intrigued. She's going to go on her, her own way. Maybe, oh, maybe this explains how we got our scout ship. She says, hey, come here. Did you catch the thing? Did I see your picture in the paper? Let me make a few phone calls tonight and I'll call the, you know, I'm a big donor for the National Galactographic Society. Let me see if I can get you your own ship. But, you know, it's been three days. We took a shower. We're not too scruffy. He shaved. He's a good-looking fella, right? I think we're good. And Relic Hunter. Thank you, David Lee. I knew you guys could do it. Let's see if Jeremy Powell is great with the ladies. Treasure Hunter? No, I think it was Relic Hunter. I never watched it, but I didn't watch The Librarian either, which is probably right up my alley. You know, those low-budget... Some of those low-budget syndicated stuff, great, man. Just great stuff. Uh, San Francisco Couture. Martial artists paint soldiers. What are you guys talking about? I don't, you, Acid Rain brings back good memories of unprepared players in Cyberpunk 2020. How about the licensing bureau looking for illegal hunting operations? Oh, well, we had we we said we were like we had like a galactic society. We know what we're doing. Oh, and I didn't I didn't um I didn't point this out. So you've got a city on the cliff, and then you have to go uh, up to the spaceport. And you go, it's like an airlock for weapons. Get your stuff, and then you have to take the elevator down into the jungle. That's how this works, right? So you're passing through the spaceport to get to the jungle, and that's how that's how we're justifying the fact that we're carrying weapons out in the wilderness. The weapons rules do not apply when you're on a danger in the wilds. It's only when you're within the confines of civilized territories where you might bump into the queen of the city. Doing 25 to life for illegal possession of a big stick. Yeah, you know, size matters when it comes to sentencing. Uh, the light-up so foils? I'd be down with that. I Well, I mean, technically, if we're keeping with the theme, they should be carrying... Um, uh, it would look more like this, right? They should be carrying axes. Party on, right? It's Blaine's world. I'm calling it the guards carry axes because that's way funnier. I'm not way funnier, but it's it's definitely in keeping with the theme. This stuff writes itself when you come up with a good solid meme theme. Electric cattle prods, vomit clubs, those are always good. Hey, we've got, uh, yeah, we're, <laughs> that's when she walks by. Everybody drops to their knees. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. She says, come on over here. Let me hook you up with a ship. And then we have one more thing to do. And we have another encounter. And we roll another. This is the last one we're going to do. On a 24 this time, our encounter is going to be with the copper. Wait, no, wait. Uh, Marines. Oh, boy. A couple of roustabouts. They're going to be carrying, not, they're not going to be carrying revolvers and cutlasses. Uh, they're going to be tooling on by, remember, the planet is 50% water. Uh, we are in a cliffside city. There's a, a river snaking through the valley. So these marines might be more like um, riverine marines. The coast that they're guarding is the riverbanks. And what do they, well, how many of them are there first? There, there's six of them. So we encounter six marines. And... Instead of trumpets, nobility is announced by a cowbell. Yeah, that's right. And the higher ranking you are, the more cowbell you get. We have encountered two dice of marines. They should be armed with revolvers and cutlasses. They are wearing mesh. There's nothing that says you can't be wearing armor. All of our guys are wearing mesh armor too, by the way. And they are going to react to us with a six, which means they are unreceptive. We're like, hey, you want to get some beers? And they're like, no, you know, flounce off. Uh, I, what, what would the slang be for an acid rain jungle planet? They, they wouldn't be like, if it, if we were in like a tiny planet, why don't you bounce? But with the acid rain, it would be something like, uh, you know, why don't you, uh, why don't you go rinse? And we've gotten through our four days. Burn off. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that. 
burn off. Why, why, you know, go, why don't you go, go suck a puddle? Uh, that would be a good one too, right? Because the puddles are going to be uh, effervescing and kicking off bad fumes. I, not a lot going on today, I don't think. So the question then becomes, and I'm going to turn this over to the chat. Let's take a little impromptu vote. Get your fingers ready, all right? What do we want to do for our next episode? We have a couple of options. And remember, we, oh, did we run into a thought occurs? It's a complicated situation. The Black Raven, uh, the scout ship was a bit, oh, so the Black Raven, the scout returns. Oh, they, they arrived in Blaine's world. We got back here. So in any one of these days, there was a chance that we ran into the crew of the Black Raven. Except, this is how one-to-one -one time works, right? Uh, because the Black Raven didn't bump into our guys, uh, on when we live played the Black Raven, they weren't going to bump into them today. Uh, I, I will, you know, we can do some fun. They may have seen, I'm going to give a one in six chance. If we can roll a one, then they saw the crew of the Black Raven bouncing around, like while they were shopping, like at the mall. You know, they were like, look, look at that little purple space baby in the little floating stroller. That's pretty sweet. I wonder what's the story with that. And then they were like, yeah, hey, did you see these new, uh, these new rain jackets? They're pretty sweet. So on a one that happens, they didn't. So they don't know anything about them. Okay. And remember, everybody thinks that the Black Raven, it's going to take a week before they're missed on the 13th. This, this is the way we got to think about this. Like, they're going to be expected to arrive on Harkwind. Not until the 13th is anybody going to know there's a problem. And it's really not until the 20th that unless word gets out that they'll start to, like, wonder, I wonder what happened to those guys. You know, a couple of days late's no big deal. Maybe as early as the 10th. So there's no chance of a rescue until later on in March. Sorry, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the gabosh on that one right now. Also, that's a little bit of metagaming. And unless, unless you can rationalize it, if you can come up with a way that our scout ship says, yeah, I'm going to go search empty space, and it just so happens to be that one hex, then, you know, as, as a DM for his players, forget about it. So the question becomes, do we want to do another jungle hunt? We did great. We got a great crew for it. We can go hunting for bigger game and see what we do, see what we come up with. Or we can go ahead and remember... Uh, we have a scout base. We're at Blaine's World. We can bounce on down to Janov 36. We have the eye and the support of Queen Carrera. That's got to be worth something. She is um, trying to reclaim her, uh, her breakaway republic of the ice bumpkins up there. She reports directly to the government on Janov 36, another acid rain. But look, see, there's a scout base, so we can refuel there. Do we want to make our way down to Intania and learn about what kind of fun things are down in Intania? It's up to you guys. What do you think? Are we going to are we going to go are we going to go uh are we going to go hyperspace or are we going to go back into the jungle? Uh do, 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 do. burn off mesh mesh muscle shirts. So mesh so you know. <laughs> the, the, we're, we're, the, does does Blaine's world have a Florida? Are, are we the, the the Blaine's World version of Florida men? Mesh armor is uh, not what you think. It's it's made of natural or synthetic leather reinforced with a lining of flexible metal mesh. Similar to chain mail, but lighter and stronger. It reduces penetration uh, or stops penetration altogether by blades and has some effectiveness against gunfire. Ineffective against laser penetration. So the laser swords... Wouldn't do you any good for those. You're so basic. Melt away. Oh, the melt away is a good one, yeah. Basic. Oh, that's a chemistry joke. I get it. You look like you dropped common loot. Crew is on Space Station Zero. I don't know. They may have bounced so far away they're into... Uh, what are you really into? They may They may have bounced all the way over to... Uh, they, they may have... They may have jumped. Not one hex, but five hexes which would mean they've jumped five parsecs from home. See how I did that? How's that for a segue? Somebody's a professional. Go hunt up a Fantastopotamus. Back to the jungle, back to the jungle. So I got three jungles, I got one hyperspace. 
You know everyone on Blaine's World is based. You gotta get a hold of some cloth armor. Mesh is pretty garbo. Uh, lighter chain equals mithril. Yeah, what is going on with my camera here? That's ridiculous. Um, I got three votes. What kind of one we got? That's like half a Kessel run. Uh, rec <laughs> reclaim her. I'm not gonna say that dark mark. They were trying to keep this a family family show. Uh, you, you know, we, we missed an opportunity for a Spaceballs reference there, right? Is is Queen Carrera a uh, a Druish princess that somehow married into the royal family? What other interesting encounters can we have in the jungles? Just uh, animals? What about the snow bumpkins doing something that needed to be scouted? Well, that's a that's a fine question. One of the things you can do to make life more interesting, let's take a look at that random encounter chart for aminals. Remember that if you roll a 10, which is entirely possible, maybe you can meet Axel Rose in the jungle. Uh, maybe the harsh chemicals explain the grumble in his voice. Let's take a look at that real quick. Uh, look, number 10 is event. Oh, we just snuck it on screen. One thing you can do to add a little bit more interest to this, there are, when you roll any of these, uh, these random encounters for the animals, oh, let's see if I got it here. One third chance, oh, he, here on the chart, it, it's all blank. That's wild, baby, that's boring. I don't like that. Generated by referee for each planet. Does it have the standard? It does not. I really like this one. With with the scavenger omnivore herbivore, does that appear on the eighty eight? Uh, it doesn't. This is just the animal types that are available based on the the, the thing, on the on, on the kind, as we say here. Uh, filter, filter, intermediate, and then you've got your special attributes. Uh, magic mushrooms, a large and surprisingly friendly bear who has blue fur. Uh, I feel like that's a, a reference that I don't get, which is fine. I don't care what kind of bear it is. It's... Ah, oh, see? All right, enough of the jokes. I like this one better. If you roll a 10, it's an event, and yeah, that's no good. So, anyway, what you can do is say, hey, remember that each of these entries is actually kicks you over to these and these, and now you've got, oh, all kinds of different things that it could be. You have to generate all, there's lots and lots of possibilities. Oh, you rolled an 11, that's a carnivore. What kind of carnivore is it? Is it a pouncer, chaser, trapper, siren, killer? But if we had an event, when we played it, our event was, I guess it rains, right? Lose a day is what our event was. But you don't have to do that. We can make up a table, throw out some ideas. Now on a one, yeah, we've got a rain delay, Right? Uh, unless it's after the seventh inning and then it's official and the game is in the books. But on a result of a two, we could run into other hunters. Oh, maybe we run into poachers who are hunting a, the wrong game out of season and we caught them red handed. What do we do? Do we ignore them? We could be accessories to a crime. Do we fight them? We're not, we're not really good at fighting people, right? Uh, Paul Stanley says, Earthquake, what is one of the classic jungle adventure encounters that adds drama and tension? Quicksand. But what if it was like acid quicksand, right? Insect attack. Insect attack. Attack. So we've, we've got some attacks here. The last one I want, how about if we are lost? We don't even have that. So now we've got a table that has multiple events on it. And because we've already found our scavenger, we could actually change the little table and personalize it by saying, uh, we're not looking for the carrion eaters anymore, the, the snipe wumps. So if we roll snipe wump from here on out, if we get a four or a 10, we're going to roll on this D6. Another event could be related to the balkanized nature. When I think Balkans, I think of Bosnia. I, yeah, it's not... I, that's my first thought as well, right? 
there's a reason we call fractious neighbors balkanized. So we can replace one of these. Maybe, maybe instead of the earthquake, the only thing, I don't want to put too many people, right? We are off in the wilderness. But I think maybe, who could we run into? I, I like the idea of getting involved with like planetary politics. Um, and I've been calling them the ice bumpkins for now because that's how the Marriotteers think of them. And I, Marriott is a city of probably a quarter of a million. It's going to be the largest city on the planet. There are other cities in, in other parts of the, the planet that are reachable by air raft. Natives trying to sell you souvenirs made in uh, Blaine's China. Uh, when I think Balkans, I think of the Bosnian War. So uh, it's an ice bumpkin something. Maybe we just do an ice bumpkin patrol. So they're going to be in furs and whatnot. And, and I don't know, we don't need to flesh this all out, right? Because the next step when we encounter poachers or ice bumpkins is going to be to refer to our, well, first of all, what's the range, right? And then we have to figure out what's their reactions. How was that for some book control, right? Ice Serbs, uh, to get with the Balkanized thing, they could be one of the nation's units in the deep jungle or somewhere which must be recontacted. Or some holdouts of a unit got lost. Uh, or have gone native. Um, so we have possibilities, right? And, and I don't, there, again, given the fact that we've got a, like, we need to roll a four. So how can we do four? One, three, three, one, three, three, one, two, two. So there's three chances. And then again with the 10, there's three more chances. So there's six out of 36. We have a one in six chance of having an event. And then we only have a one in six chance beyond that of running into an ice pumpkin patrol. So there's no need to resolve any of this right now. We're just setting up possibilities. We are in that quantum state where anything could happen and it won't collapse down until we actually roll this. The ape man, ooh, the very heart of darkness. Uh, would you like to replace... Oh, yeah. Uh, when you Now, when you say I, ape man, are you talking about like Acid Kong, or are we talking about like the the Uga Booga jungle ape men? Right? Are we talking about like uh, the the missing links? The technically dark the 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 rumpus the the wump snipes were rodents of unusual size. We left it vague as to whether they were lizards or uh, mammals, and on this planet that might not even mean anything. I think everything has here, we decided, has either a, a chitinous plates that f funnel the acid off, or they have, like, a leathery skin. They definitely have larger lungs. I was thinking about this. I thought, what do you need to do to survive on a planet that has a high carbon content in the atmosphere half the time? Uh, and, and so I started looking up, and this is one of the things I love about Traveler. I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a mini rant. I just have a planet, and I was like, oh, ice rain, a acid rain. Okay, that's cool. Well, if there's animals there, how do those animals survive? And so I started looking up, well, what effects does high carbon in the atmosphere have, right? How do you protect yourself from uh, tear gas, basically? Because that's what happens when you get caught out in this rain. It's low grade. It's not going to, like like we said, it's not going to melt your flesh. But it might if it stays on you for a long time. So they're going to be effective at getting the water off of them. They're largely going to be waterproof, so this material runs off of them. But not only that, their lungs are going to be larger than normal. So if you had a rodent of unusual size, you know, again, 25 kilograms, right? These are 50-pound critters. By the way, if we had two of those things, we are packing 110 pounds of material out of live animal in cages. That must have been a grueling hike. That day back... Through the jungle, these guys are going to have to slow down. We might have, like, we might have missed a trick there. Might have had to make two days because they were packing such a heavy load. I need to check the encumbrance rules. Those are important for every game that's worth playing. Uh, but to go back to what I was talking about, I found myself looking up, um, well, okay, what, what do you do if somebody has breathed too much carbon dioxide? I collected some samples, right? I'm a, I'm a scienceologist. And so we collected a bunch of samples and, and to get the, we were shipping them via airplane. So to do that, you have to use blue gel ice. And to cool the blue gel ice, we ran down to Gas Pro. We picked up a bunch of dry ice, chunks of dry ice. And you put that in contact with gel ice and it freezes it. Well, we put all that in a cooler. We put it in the back of the car and we drove to the hotel. 
and didn't think anything of it. We went, got shower. We're going to drive to the, the restaurant. We get in the car and me and the guy I'm sampling with, we kind of go, man, I'm really tired all of a sudden. And like instantly we looked at each other with these wide eyes and like dove out of the car, like Dukes of Hazard style and are sucking air because we could have gone to sleep and died from carbon monoxide poisoning. There's a, a thing it's called, uh, cr- cr- oh, I can't remember now. It's like carb. I want to say Carpathia, but that's a country or a, a region in Romania. It's called like Craprythmia or something like that, where you you really need to have like high content O2. And, you know, you you're the main way you expel carbon dioxide is through heavy breathing, right? When we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Since when did a geologist need to freeze dirt? Well, I, you know, okay, so I'm, I'm actually an environmental scientist, and when the contaminants get down to the bedrock, we don't usually worry about it. It's in that upper zone of soil where it's really at the highest risk. So we're taking soil samples, technically, and those we submit to the lab for analysis, and they need to be cooled to slow down the chemical breakdown that occurs. When you pull dirt from 25 feet down and you bring it up to the surface, now it's been exposed and the like contaminants can start to um, volatilize. They like go from the, from the sample out into the atmosphere. So you have to pack them really good. You got to put them in airtight containers and you want to cool them down so the chemical reactions slow way down. Anyway, that's boring daytime stuff. The point is, I found myself thinking like, I really want to know about what happens biologically. And this is where we kind of tie a neat little ribbon on today's episode. We talked about how guys that play these games are a different breed and how we are naturally curious people. And playing Traveler is one of those pastimes that leads you to greater curiosity about the world that we live in. And and I'll tell you, it was actually a little bit hard to research acid rain because there's so much, you know, search engines are such garbage these days. They only want to tell you about one thing. You know, you, you need to live like a third world peasant in order to save the planet. And so it was a little hard, but, you know, you find yourself looking up things like, oh, well, I should figure out if I'm accelerating at two Gs, how long do I need to accelerate before I reach a speed that I can reach this distance? And it's, it's, really, it's really profoundly cerebral when you take a game like this and start thinking about, well, but that means, oh, but that means... Oh, but that means our animals have greater lung capacity. They need to store oxygen. Their blood cells, their red blood cells are going to be larger than normal because they need to carry excess oxygen. They need to be able to store that oxygen for the times when the rains come through and they have to hunker down and wait for the atmosphere to kind of clear, for the winds to blow, right? They have to live in cold weather regimes. If we're the, I looked up, I thought, oh, maybe the ice is uh, carbon. Um, you know, maybe it's dry ice up in the polar regions. It's not. In order to have dry ice, you have to have a free, like absurdly cold temperatures and low pressures. But we know the air pressure on this planet is is fairly high because it's eight thousand square. Mi- it's eight thousand miles across. Is it eight or six? Uh, either way, you do get dry ice at the poles on Mars. But Mars is a much smaller planet. I think it's like 4,000 miles across, maybe 5,000 miles. Blaine's world is a big enough planet. Uh, Yeah, here we go. 8,000. It's actually bigger than the Earth. So at, and maybe that's why we live in the cliffs. Because if you're down at the equator, the air pressure is not going to be 15 pounds per square inch. It's going to be more like 18, which is oppressive. So we live up at the elevations, these towering cliffs. We're up at two, three, four thousand feet elevation. So we get slightly lower air pressure. Our people don't have to walk, live in domes anymore. Granted, they're in like artificial caverns carved out of the rock. And what does that tell us? You know, we can go down this road all we want. When, when you have a cliff, here's the geologist talking. So um, the 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 valley looks something like this, right? And if you look at a profile of the valley, normally it would look like this, but we have these huge caverns carved out that are big enough for a city to perch in. And maybe there's a little bit of an overhang here, so the acid rain drains like this, and you get these wonderful little curtains of, of water running down to where our river valley is. And, and we said this is broad. We've got a pretty big, call it 10 times exaggeration here. You know, this valley, we said, is like, 
is like 20 to 25 miles across with our, our river that our Marines is kind of meandering back and forth. But it's a flat bottom, which means, well, wait a minute, but what about these big things? Well, those must have been carved a thousand years ago. Chalkworms burrowing the walls, valid, valid. But I'm thinking that what really, what might have happened here is that you've got sea level change. That for a time, the river flowed and it carved out these big, um, these big lenses, if you will, in the in the side and then maybe it the 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 water level fell so it was right about here for a while and it carved out these these ledges and then it dropped a little bit and it carved out a little bit more down here and that explains why you've got this like gutter that helps direct water down into the plains and of course wherever our river is we're going to see along these cliffs, we're going to see lots of streams flowing into that river. And that's part of why you want a guide with you, because he's going to be able to help you find places to cross over these individual streams. And, you know, so again, you know, this is just kind of the, well, if there's acid rain, then that means, oh, but it's 8,000 miles. So that means, but that means, but that means, and we can do this as a solo gamer to occupy our thoughts as we're, uh, as we're driving long distances um, for Americans or, you know, for you Britbongs as we're, we're walking down the streets or on a train ride or I, I don't know. I don't know what you do that, that keeps you occupied when you should be driving, but, you know, I, I wish you all the best with it. Hey, chat, are you, are you guys still with me on this one? Um, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you guys are better than most people. That's all. I, who doesn't love a good bell curve? I tell you. I like a good bell curve, given that this is an IQ bell curve. This is my this is my target audience right here. The algorithm can go get bent because I'm not looking for these dopes over here. Y'all can just get bent. I'm not even looking for these guys or these midwits. They're tedious. I'm looking for guys like you. Head cannon for the wump snipes is that their eyes are low on their faces to keep them below from where the rain would be contacting them. So the line of sight is limited to closer distances. They probably have an excellent sense of smell, though. They are carrion eaters, and so they're able to find uh, things that are laying there rotting, right? Wear hazmat suits made of tums. We could eat the bugs, live in the pod. You cannot, we talked about that before, you cannot eat the space bugs on this planet because it has a, a corrosive atmosphere. None of the animals are edible. Man, let you play without me watching for 15 minutes, Dice Tales says, and everybody gets into trouble. We're, we're skating pretty close to the line here, aren't we? GURP space gets really deep in the weeds for flying. You spend a lot of time calculating your Delta V. Uh, I love the space combat. I'm looking forward to getting in a fight, like a legitimate fight in Traveler, or at least even just like a chase because of the way they've simplified the like vector movement. Oh, it's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Uh, who knew watching Traveler would lead to a science lesson? Uh, David Lee, gaming is so beneficial mentally, it does. Uh, David Lee doesn't, uh, he says, my students don't. Wait, who knew watching Traveler would lead to a science lesson? Wait, what did, I'm not sure. Oxbow Caves? Yeah, Chalkco Canyon. That's not a cave. It's not a cave. What is it? It's a, is there a specific word for that geographic feature? Uh, yeah, Oxbow Caves is the way to look at it. Uh, most traveler games, okay, it's a planet with acid rain. Here we've got a triple canopy, people living in sandstone caverns, and all kinds of details. Hard sci-fi. Who doesn't, uh, who doesn't, who likes a bell curve? Yeah, my students don't like a bell curve. Yeah, I know, but, you know, remember Pareto principle, right? This this is our bell curve, and 80%, 80 20% of your people do 80% of the work. This is 80% of the brains in your classroom. And this is 80% of the people in your classroom who want to stick these guys in a locker. Uh, that's not a cave. It is Star Wars. Um, there we go. Hey, we've been at it for over an hour. We're good. So next time we meet, I don't know what we're going to do to fill time. Because here's the other question. Since we're going back out into the jungle, we're not going to be available until the 6th. We're getting, we're getting pretty far ahead of ourselves uh, in real time here. So I think maybe next time we'll probably not do any adventure stuff. We can go ahead and maybe we'll just roll up, figure out a little bit more, add some more character, add some more contrast. We'll figure out what Intania is like. You can ignore Ackerley. That's the next planet we roll up. 
But until we move into Janov 36 Dentania, we don't need to generate any of these. And uh, once again, looking at the calendar, we are still like it's not until when is when is Chad Solo available? Uh, his ship not until the fifteenth. We know he's going to lead a very boring life until the 15th, so we have until March 15th before we're really going to take a look at him. But there's more we can do. There's more stuff we can look at. There's more fun to have. And, in fact, we may decide we're going to wait another couple of days uh, before we go out, which means we have another couple of one in three chances. Let's see. That would be point six. There's, there's, there's a 36% chance that we don't run into somebody else. And if we run into the queen again, maybe we get a plus one on our reaction. Maybe we can, uh, you know, win her over. And maybe she invites us over for one of her private contents, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, ooh, golly, how did Chad get pushed out so far? Well, he... How did Chad get pushed out so far? Uh, he spent two weeks in a submersible. And, oh, it was, the, the big thing with him is he's waiting to get on a spaceship. He's got a high passage that he earned, but the ship doesn't land until the 7th or like the 8th. So the ship that he's going to take to make this jump to doesn't leave until the 15th. So that's the big thing for him is it looks like, it looks like Chad is going to be our guy that's doing some exploring and we may wind up linking up with him later. Hey, that's it for today. I really got to go. It's been, yeah, he's down in. Corvusburg. Corv Cor Corv Corvinus, sorry. Yeah, till next time. I'm praying for you.